Okay, so um, what I'd love to do here is just kind of walk through the basic facilitator protocol. And, you know, this is really held within the context of recognizing, you know, every protocol, every set of rules um, can be useful up to a point. And then often the rule, we find a place, if we're really in the heart of our practice, we find that place where the rules start to break down. Um, because we're in the moment and the moment is fundamentally uncertain. We don't know what's going to arise. So we don't know if some previous insight and some previous like learning passed down to us as a protocol or a rule or a set of beliefs or rites or rituals. Like we don't actually know if that's going to be sufficient for this next moment because we don't know what's coming <laughs> um, fundamentally. And I think here as social meditation facilitators, we have to work with that not knowing, you know, make space for it in the, in the facilitation. At the same time, it's useful to know what we're doing just on a very practical level. So this is a way of facilitating a basic practice within, within the framework of Buddhist geeks and our Buddhist geeks network. You're welcome to bring this outside of the, of this network in terms of how you facilitate, or you can let it inform how you facilitate. Um, but it's, it's a basic, uh, protocol. It's not the only way to do this. Um, it does move through the three phases of social meditation that we talked about, um, previously the setup practice and debrief phase. And we did a round of this together earlier as a demonstration. So, you know, kind of what that looked like. We had roughly 10 minutes or a little less for the setup. Uh, we spent 20 minutes in practice and then we did a a one or two minute debrief, a quick debrief. And, and that gets you really in 30 minutes, two thirds of the time that you're together, you could spend actually practicing. That's doable with this protocol. Um, to begin with, uh, at the beginning of a session, we just start with a little bit of silence. So this is now moving into the setup phase. And I'd like to also share the link to this so you can see it while we, while we go through it. So um, let me... I'm gonna send you the most beta version of this in the social meditation guide. Here's the actual link. Feel free to follow along. Um, so we're starting off with a little bit of silence, just um, letting people arrive and settle. It's okay if someone says hi or talks or whatever. Uh, the way I handle this as a facilitator is I just wave. And I, I, I remain silent so that it, it's sort of subtly communicated that's a silent time. But I don't try to enforce silence. I'm like, don't speak. Um, so it's, just, it's a subtle invitation to silence for a couple minutes. And this gives time for people to settle in and just physically get prepared for the practice. Uh, and then we move into a quick check-in. And this is something we've done here in this group a number of times, so you know it now. Um, and the, and the basic, the, the simplest version of this, I think is like a one breath, quick check-in where you share your name, where you're based and how you're doing pretty simple. Um, there's other variations in how you can do it. You could suggest to people that they could say there is before they share what state of mind there is. There's anxiety and worry. There's excitement and anticipation, whatever. Uh, the quick check-in also provides an opportunity as a facilitator to do a tech check. That's one nice thing about it. So I can hear immediately if someone has a major problem, if, you can, if we can't hear them um, or anything else that arises, and we can kind of quickly troubleshoot that. Um, but it's like we want to really quickly troubleshoot that stuff and really kind of move people toward being witnesses if they can't within a few minutes get their tech working but just let them know that that's happening so they can troubleshoot it later. Um, and then from there, we want to actually get into sharing the, the details of the session. So here we want to just let people know what we're going to be doing. And this is particularly useful for folks that are new. If they're just coming in to the first time they've ever done this, it's just nice to have some sense of what to expect. So, you know, we're going to begin with some basic instructions on the practice, and then we'll spend the the rest of the time practicing, leaving just a minute or two at the end for this quick debrief. Okay, great. Now let's get into the instructions. Here we review the instructions. And, and there's a lot of different ways you can do this. This is where there's a lot of cre 
creative space, I think, in the facilitation role in particular in this protocol, where how you review the instructions, there's a lot of ways to do that. We're going to go over that really in depth over the next several weeks of this training. Uh, and what we'll look at are the ways that we can um, bring in our own personal reflections, bring in quotes, bring in stories, um, the actual core instructions, the very kind of bare bones of what to cover um, in terms of the frame and the options and the um, compression and the order, the size of the group and the uh, who the attribution, you know, who developed this originally just to, to just to uh, pay homage to the <laughs> originators. Um, and then from there, we actually um, also want to make sure before we begin that we introduce the witness role and the safety release valve. Uh, one mechanism for this is just to invite people to turn their video off if you're facilitating virtually. Um, yeah, I like it, it's simple. And um, this is also a place where you, you could mention the safety release valve which is an option in most practices to basically pass in, in some way or another. And with the just freestyle noting that we did, I introduced that by mentioning that you could say just passing or just don't know or just uncertain, just thank you. Giving people some options, you know, just highlighting what they could do if they're not sure what to do, that's the safety release valve. Um, and then after you've introduced these two ways of engaging with the practice that really in some ways are, are kind of trauma informed mechanisms to give people a way to to participate as they feel is needed to not get caught in kind of self-referential looping uh, which can lead to social anxiety and kind of it can it can kind of get revved up in these kind of contexts without these things we found so, um, so that's why we recommend always mentioning them or reminding people. Uh, and, then, and then from here, we can just see, are there any questions? You know, any questions about the instructions? If you've done a pretty thorough job of explaining things and, it, and you've done it in a way that's pretty clear and simple, usually there's not many questions. Um, if there are questions and you've done a terrible shit job of, <laughs> of reviewing the instructions at the beginning, it's okay as long as you ask if there are any questions. Because if people have questions, they'll ask them and then typically, and then you can kind of clarify. So really you could just say, we're gonna do just freestyle noting today. Any questions? <laughs> um, I'd also mention just to, just going back a moment, when you review the instructions, it is also helpful to demonstrate the practice. Um, it's helpful to kind of uh, show what it looks like at the very least to do it out loud yourself for a moment or two. Or, you know, give people an example. You can also do a group demonstration if you invite a couple people to join you um, that know the practice or feel confident they can do it based on the instructions, then you can do that as well. Um, from there, we do the practice. And um, that really, as a facilitator, if you're virtual, it involves setting up breakout rooms if you're using those and timers and stuff like that. And just tracking kind of what's going down. And at the very end of the practice, you ring the bell. Uh, you don't have to ring a bell. You could do something else, but that's what I typically do. Um, and then there's a debrief phase. So we move from the practice to debrief. And this is an interesting transition, isn't it? We just went through this. It's like you're moving from one kind of mode into another, where we're opening back up the conceptual aperture to include more conceptualization than is often done in these practices where we're very, very simple and basic and intimate. Um, and so here we're, we're, we're opting in this basic facilitator protocol to keep the debrief very simple and to just invite people to say, uh, to use a word or two or, or three or more if they need to share how the session went. You could also recommend that they say there was, it's an option. There was unity and openness, whatever it is. And then that way you get to hear 
and you get a get get a, a sense of the pulse, you know, of how the session was for the group. It's great feedback as a facilitator to get that information. It also gives you information if you need to follow up, if you feel like you might need to follow up with someone, um, if something came up for them, and you want to, you know, just send out a, a a message of support and say, hey, if there's anything you need, I'm here. Um, without having something like that, it's very hard to, to understand what's happening for folks, even though you just went through the experience with them. You may not have been in a, in a breakout room with everybody if you had breakout rooms as a facilitator. You, you likely weren't. Um, so it's useful to get that data um, and just to get a sense. And it's nice as a participant too, to have that, that, that sort of verified sense of people's experience. like. And it usually they they match, right? It's like, oh, how I thought it was is how it was. <laughs> but if it's if it's not the case, then it's it's good feedback too. Uh, and then after we've done the quick debrief, which usually only takes a minute or two, depending on how many folks are there, um, then you can just say goodbye. And here I like to try to end on time. <laughs> you know, like I, I like to try to nail the stick the landing. You know, as they say in gymnastics. Um, but it's sometimes we don't, and we we bounce or whatever. Uh, a few minutes over, but um, yeah, this is a chance to just say goodbye in whatever way you like. And each facilitator is going to have a different quality. Some people may like to bow, you know, they bow. I remember when I was um, on retreat with Jack Cornfield and with my with my wife Emily uh, during a long retreat at Spirit Rock uh, Meditation Center in California. We were um, in a, a question and answer period. Um, with Jack and someone was asking him, why don't you, when you come into the room, bow to the Buddha like so many of the other teachers do? And Jack would always come into the room and he'd look at the altar and at Spirit Rock, you have both a Buddha and you have a masculine and a feminine uh, uh, statue side by side, um, Buddha and uh, Prajnaparamita, the feminine uh, statue. And he, he would just sit, he would just stand there and then he'd sit down. A lot of other teachers, they would do like a formal bow or they would bow three times like in a more monastic style bow. And Jack never did that. And someone asked him like, why don't you do that? And he said, because I, want, I don't want to, to send the message as like the founder of this institution and this, you know, like, that you have to bow. Uh, and, and that's the same way I feel. Like it's whatever, however people want to engage with the formal ritual of saying goodbye like typically it becomes a habit or a ritual there's something there's some way that we do that and uh however it feels appropriate in this context as a facilitator i would suggest you do that so and then people will do what they feel comfortable with sometimes it even converges